video 11 of the master course quantum chemistry of molecular electromagnetic properties. The topic of this lecture is gates transformations. Before we conclude this chapter on the Schrödinger equation in the presence of electromagnetic fields, we have to come back to the definition of the potentials, the scalar and the vector potential, which we had uh, covered in uh, chapter 2.4. And one of the um, unpleasant consequences of uh, these definitions. And I have given them here again. And the point is that uh, the scalar and the vector potential are defined in a way implicitly from the electromagnetic uh, fields. Because we are, have an equation for the electric field as derivatives, spatial derivatives of the scalar potential and the time derivative of the vector potential and for the uh, magnetic field as the curl of the uh, vector potential, meaning that the fields are defined as derivatives of the potentials. This definition as derivatives implies that we can add a constant to the potentials, uh, a constant with respect to the derivatives taken in the definition to the scalar potential or to the vector potential which will change the potentials, but it will not change the fields. In particular, we can look at a so-called gauge function, chi here. And if we then add the uh, gradient of chi to the vector potential, or subtract the time derivative of chi to the electrostatic potential, this will change the potentials, obviously, but it leaves the electric and the magnetic field unchanged meaning these new potentials phi prime or a prime are describing equally well as the original scalar and vector potentials the electric and magnetic fields these kind of uh, equations here are called gauge transformations now the point is that all equations describing the physics of our system, they must be form invariant under such gauge transformations because the physics uh, cannot be changed. I mean, the observable quantities are the electric uh, and magnetic fields uh, and which in our equations we represent by the mathematical quantities here, the vector potential and the scalar potential. And as long as we don't change the fields, then of course the physics is not changed and therefore the equations we have are allowed to change their form, but uh, they still must lead to the same physical observations. Now this form invariance, and we'll see that in, uh, later in this chapter, what that precisely means, uh, applies in particular, of course, to the time-dependent time Schrodinger equation here. When we now replace the scalar and vector potential in the Hamiltonian, by the new gauge transformed scalar potential phi prime and a prime, the uh, gauge transformed, transformed vector potential, um, as I've done here. So here we have a plus uh, the gradient of this um, uh, gauge function, and here we have the scalar potential minus the time derivative of this gauge function. We get a new gauge transformed Hamiltonian h prime. As you will see in some of the exercises, instead of just uh, replacing the vector potential and the scalar potential in the Hamilton with gauge transformed, I can also derive at uh, this gauge transformed Hamiltonian if I apply uh, this uh, a gauge transformation, um, which very much looks like a sort of a unitary transformation uh, to the Hamiltonian. But because we are dealing with the time dependent Schrodinger equation, I can't do it just alone with H, but I have to do it with h minus the uh, time derivative operator from the right hand side of the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So if I apply uh, a gauge transformation in this form, where I have here um, e to the i and then the sum over uh, this gauge function um, for each electron, and here corresponding with uh, e to the minus i. Um, then I arrive at the same um, gauge transforced Hamiltonian, which I have 
obtained up here just by replacing the vector potential with the gauge and the vector and the scalar potential with the corresponding gauge transform potentials. I can obtain now this form invariance of the ton dependent Schrödinger equation if I correspondingly gauge transform also my time dependent wave function. So I set up psi, I go to psi prime where I obtain this psi prime by taking my original wave function and multiply with the same uh, uh, gauge transformation exponential operator here. Um, and why is that now? Why do I obtain a form invariance by uh, doing this gauge transformation also with a wave function? Well, you easily can see that because now we have a Schrodinger equation which is h prime minus i h bar in the time derivative applied to the psi prime. And if I insert then the equation, the expression for psi prime, the gauge transform wave function like this, and my Hamiltonian like this, then you can see that uh, this operator here, which stands to the right of the Hamiltonian, multiplied with this operator here, which stands to the left of the wave function, uh, the product of those is 1, which means by uh, I, I get back to the original Schrodinger equation. So I, don't, I haven't changed the physics as long as I not only have a gauge transformation of the Hamiltonian, but also of the wave function. And that means that whenever I replace my vector potential or scalar potential by a gauge transformed vector potential and scalar potential a prime and phi prime, I also have to apply the corresponding gauge transformation to the wave function. That was for the um, time dependent Schrader equation. In the case of the time independent Schrader equation, uh, we have precisely the same, except of course we don't have the time derivative operator. And our uh, gauge transformation function then uh, is also the gauge function, it's also not time dependent, but otherwise uh, we have the same uh, situation. Now, if you, for example, look at um, the product of what is standing to the right of the Hamiltonian and what we have here in the wave function, the product of those who gives one, and correspondingly, uh, if the wave function is the bra, then we have, of course, to have to take the uh, complex conjugate also of this one, which then will cancel the gauge uh, transformation operator standing to the left of the Hamiltonian. The expectation value now of our Hamiltonian, and compare the expectation value with the gauge transformed Hamiltonian and the corresponding gauge transformed wave function, we will see that uh, the result is actually the same as if we would have used the not gauge transformed wave function again, because so for the Hamiltonian it works, but uh, it does not apply necessarily to all arbitrary operators. Not all arbitrary operators are gauge invariant. For example, let's look at the canonical momentum operator. The canonical momentum operator is actually not gauge invariant. So if we would take a, an expectation value of this operator with either the gauge trans the original wave function or the gauge transformed wave function psi prime, those two expectation values will not be the same. However, if we take an expectation value of the mechanical or kinematical momentum operator pi, which is the canonical momentum operator plus the contribution from the vector potential, then the expectation values uh, are actually gauge invariant. So if I have take uh, uh, pi prime, again, where, where prime, the gauge transformed, mechanical momentum operator is the one where I have replaced the uh, vector potential with the gauge transform vector potential. So if I take uh, expectation value of this operator with the gauge transform wave function, the result is exactly the same as if I would do that with the original kinematical momentum operator and the original wave function. Therefore, this mechanical or kinematical momentum operator is sometimes also called in the literature the gauge invariant momentum operator. An important gauge transformation uh, in the context of the calculation of molecular properties is given by this gauge function, where B is the uh, magnetic field, R, G, O, where G, O stands for gauge origin, is an arbitrary point in space, which is called the gauge origin, and R, I is, uh, of course, the position vector of the electrons. Um, in order to apply this gauge function, of course, uh, uh, remember uh, adding it to the 
vector potential, we add the gradient of this function, which then looks like this. Uh, and as a consequence of that, um, the expression for the uh, gauge transformed vector potential looks like this. Uh, and you can see that uh, um, why this RGO is called gauge origin, because it essentially changes uh, uh, the origin with respect to uh, the magnetic field here. And the vector potential then becomes a linear function of this gauge origin. Let's look now at uh, two gauge transformations in the case of time-dependent properties. And let's start out with the case where the um, our expression for the scalar potential would be zero. Um, and that vector potential only depends on time. That has the consequence that uh, the electric field is then described here in terms of the time derivative of the vector potential, whereas the magnetic field is actually zero. If the vector potential only depends on time, then of course the curl of the vector potential is zero, so we don't have a magnetic field. So we only have an electric field, which varies with time. Now let's uh, look at the gauge transformation, where the gauge function is given as minus the vector potential times position vector of the electrons. Applying this gauge transformation, then, uh, will actually, applying it to the uh, vector potential, will actually mean that the vector potential is now set to zero, whereas uh, the gauge transformed scalar potential is now minus the electric field times the position vector of uh, the electron. So by, by uh, replacing, uh, here by adding this uh, gauge function, I can sort of change from the case where um, I had no scalar potential, but I had a vector potential, to the case where I have no vector potential, but a scalar potential. Actually, this gauge uh, is called the length gauge, because then the uh, interaction with the, um, electromag with the electric field, here the time variant electric field, is expressed in terms of the position vector of the electrons. Uh, I can also use another gauge uh, function here, which looks more complicated. But um, using this gauge function implies then that um, the gauge transformed scalar potential has this form, which is actually then just a squared, so the vector potential squared, which means that this will cancel the second order contribution to the molecular Hamiltonian from the um, vector potential. The time dependent but spatially uniform electric field will then enter the Hamiltonian through the A dot P term, which means that then we have, will have the um, electric field in connection with the canonical momentum operator of the electrons and not in connection with the uh, position vector of the electrons. And therefore, this uh, gauge is also called the velocity gauge. So a time-dependent but spatially uniform electric field can, depending on what kind of gauge we are in or what kind of gauge functions we use, can enter the Hamiltonian either in this form, where we have minus the electric field scalar product with the position vector of the electrons, which is called the length gauge, or in this velocity gauge, where we have the vector potential times the canonical momentum of the electron. Finally, the last uh, gauge function or uh, gauge I want to mention is the so-called Lorentz gauge, where the gauge function is chosen in such a way that this equation here is fulfilled so that the uh, divergence of the gauge transformed vector potential plus the time derivative of the gauge transformed uh, scalar potential is, is zero. With this gauge, the uh, third and fourth Maxwell equations in vacuum which I have written here, take a simple form also in terms of the potentials, as given here, where we have that the uh, Laplacian of the scalar potential times the plus minus the second derivative with respect to time of the scalar potential is zero, and correspondingly of the vector potential. In the following chapters, we will not discuss the Lorentz gauge uh, anymore. But in chapter seven, when we talk about electronic uh, excitations and transition moments and oscillator strengths, we will see that uh, we can get um, an expression for the oscillator strength in the length gauge.
and in the velocity gauge. 